Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There I am. Good morning. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. I had an even tardier start than typical. Good morning. Good morning. Lots of people, I think, are still out in the lobby. Uh, but again, welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. I'm looking around, lots of familiar faces. My name is Zach. I am the associate minister here. And again, it's my privilege to welcome you to church this morning. Uh, in the way of announcements, uh, several things going on this morning. Excuse me, this morning is the last morning to drop off Christmas bo our boxes, the gift boxes for Operation Christmas Child. If you forgot, you have them at home, you've worked on them, or mm, you just forgot to do it, uh, there usually is time during the week to come in. So this is the last Sunday to drop them off, but if you forgot to bring it this morning, you could still bring it by during the week and leave it out there, and we will collect those and get them where they need to go. But thank you to everyone who has participated in Operation Christmas Child this year. Um, following the service today, we will have youth group that is led by me and my lovely wife, Hannah, um, and we do lunch. The people, the children here who know about that need to know about, I think, need to know about that, but that's meeting here after church this morning. Um, additionally, we will be meeting again for youth group next Sunday, so instead of it being every other week, due to the holidays and the holiday schedule, we're going to meet this Sunday and next Sunday after church for youth group. Um, also meeting today after the service is our women's ministry mentor mentee um, lunch i believe that will be somewhere floating around here if you have any questions talk to linda although she is probably busy preparing for that so this morning the women's ministry mentor mentee luncheon is happening here following the service i imagine that if you are interested in that and not a part of it that you would be more than welcome to stay and eat and inquire about that ministry. Uh, but that's happening today, and that is headed up by Linda Ayton. Uh, other women's ministry things, uh, we have a women's group who meets after church on a regular basis. They are going to be, um, they're working on a study in the life of Jesus, and that's led by Mary Pafford. So if you have any questions, you can contact her, or if you don't know who she is, you could ask around and be pointed in her direction, or her email is included in the bulletin. And their next meeting will be next Sunday following church. And that's a little bit after church uh, to give people time to get food and, and do things that they might need to do, get, get kids home, for instance. Uh, but their next meeting will be next Sunday, November 19th. And then they'll wrap up with one more meeting on December 3rd. Uh, speaking of December and December 3rd, we have Christmas caroling and a fellowship meal, fellowship dinner on December 3rd. So that, that night at 5.30, we will meet at Northridge, just up the street here. We'll meet right in the lobby. Just a fair warning, uh, it is always very warm in there. So if you come in your best looking Christmas sweater, you might be a little hot. Uh, but it, it, if that's the price you're willing to pay for, for the look, then go for it. But we will be meeting at 5.30 over there as after, we do, after we are done, sorry, we're done there singing Christmas carols. Um, we will return here for a dinner, and that will be over around 7 or 7.30. So December 3rd, 5.30 at Northridge for Christmas caroling. It is a wonderful time. You do not need to be a singer. You just need to have a smiling face. Uh, the people over at Northridge are always happy for guests, and with enough of our voices, the worst voice among us could be hidden. I'll put it, put it that way. So it, it's always good to have people there singing loudly and singing with a smile on their face. Uh, and it is December, which means it's the m coming up on the most wonderful time of the year, which is budget season. So our budget and our congregational meeting, uh, that will take place the following Sunday on the 10th. And that will be uh, following church. We strongly, strongly encourage any members of Prairie View to be at that meeting um, or to have someone in your household represented there. Uh, we try to be very open and forward with our budget so people know where every dollar is going. And that's, that's a chance to review that as a congregation and vote on it. It's also a chance to have Ben... Ben, myself, and Nancy maybe get, in, get in fr up in front of the ch congregation and, and explain what's been going on for the past year, what we're hoping to do in the future, and just give a bit of an update, a deeper level update on Prairie View Christian Church. So that is December 10th um, following church, so in a few weeks. That is all I've got in way of announcements. Um, I'm going to 
read now from some scripture. And actually this morning, um, in between songs or before songs, I'm going to, we've been flashing Bible verses on the screen this morning. I'm going to take time to read those. So these two passages I'm about to read are going to set up the song that we will be singing here in a few moments. So it's Micah 7, 18 and 19 says this, who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And then Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 say this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this morning. Thank you uh, that your mercies are new every morning and that your kindness and your faithfulness, your love and patience for us never run out. And so wherever we've been, wherever we're going, whatever's going on, God, you are big enough for us, big enough for the problems we have. You are big enough to care for us and to not grow tired or weary of us and our failings. And I, I pray that this morning that would give us reason to sing loudly and to pray attentively and to listen to your word preached, uh, to have it move our hearts, knowing that you are a good God who is steadfast in your love and faithful and, and patient and with mercies that never end. And, and I pray this morning for a uh, whole host of people who can't be here for different reasons. God, thank you for the many, many people who make up this church and the wonderful environment you've given to us to encourage one another and to build one another up and to love one another and bear with one another and all these things that we might become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. As we move through our service this morning, help us bear that in mind, that it is you Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that we worship. And it is you who we are trying to become like through your own power working in us. God, we pray that that power would be at work this morning and we would humbly submit to it and trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shuffle back to the guitar over here. So while I'm doing that, if you would stand and be ready to sing. Anybody guess the song we're going to sing? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. So tender is calling us home. He welcomes 
Say this, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Lord Almighty, 
Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's It's a bit longer, so it's not on the screen this morning. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, so he told them this parable, Jesus. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance.
grace that brought me to the fold of God. Upon His grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew His praise with all the glory It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing His praise. Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the blood that bore me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the to the fold of God. Thank you. You can have a seat. Good morning and welcome. For those that don't know me, my name is Carl Pafford. I have the privilege of serving on the elder team here and also to, as we transition to this time of worship through communion and giving, uh, provide the meditation today. Thank you for everybody here that doesn't have their nose in their phone watching the Colts play, which is kind of nice actually as we look around. Of course, last score I heard we were down three to zero, but that was before church started, so we shall see. So our small group, which meets Monday nights and has room for two or three more people, um, is studying Recovering Redemption by Matt Chandler. It's a study he put out in about 2014. It's a video study. We like Matt Chandler studies because Craig, who leads it, tends to like to bounce off of the video. But there's lots of churchy words in there. Propitiation, sanctification, reconciliation. And I know others have been up here preaching from the pulpit and just gone through the different words, but really with reconciliation it settles down to, it is the act of reconciling, or to settle or resolve. How do we reconcile with God that we were just singing about there? We are separated from God, period, dot. There's nothing, if you've been to church, you know this, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, we are separated from God. So how do we reconcile? How do we resolve this? Well, in Romans 10, 1 through 4, Paul states, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteous and right for righteousness to everyone who believes. He was talking about the Jews at the time, but they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and seek to establish their own righteousness through the acts that they do. So they had all the laws. We've talked about them up here before. If you've been in the church at all, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, have to wash your hands a certain way. You have to do this this way. You can't do this. It was all about setting guardrails. You know, well, their guardrails were 10 miles from the cliff instead of 10 feet from the cliff. But that's not what brings reconciliation. In communion, we celebrate this reconciliation. Our reconciliation, if you are a Christian, you have been reconciled. But in communion, it's not a way for us to develop righteousness. It's not a checkbox that we are going to do. Because you come up here and you take the little wafer and you take the juice does not mean by doing this, I have become saved. Instead, it is an acknowledgement of our reconciliation through Christ. In 1 Corinthians, this passage that is well known if you've been in the church, 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death when you do this. We reconcile through Jesus to God, not again because we do communion. Coming up here is not some magic act that is going to enable you to be in the presence of God. What we are doing is what Paul said. We are acknowledging what Jesus did for us. He was our sin offering. His blood was poured out that we represent with the juice. His body was broken on the cross as the wafer is a symbol for. There's nothing magical about communion. Communion is a remembrance of our reconciliation. And that's why we celebrate this every week here. We do this as a Christian, remembering that we are together with God because of Jesus. We spend time on that. If you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity to reconcile to God. Any of us in leadership would be happy to sit and talk about this after the service. Use this communion time to think about that. Think about your questions. Think about your concerns. We would love to talk to you about why Jesus is our Lord and Savior here and why we celebrate every week. So, if you're a believer in Christ here in a little bit, come on up here. The cup has a wafer in the top. If you're not familiar with that, bring it back to your seat. Take it at your own time. Hold the cup till the end, and when you leave, we have um, trash bins outside the doors heading out. At the same time, we also celebrate our offering. If you are a member or regular attender, the offering is for you. If you are our guest, you are our guest. If you feel led, please feel free to put something in the black boxes up here, but don't feel led. I do want to say that Craig shared at Elders this week. The admin team got together. Um, again, we have faithful givers for 20-plus years here. Budget looks very good. We're able to do things through your giving back to God, whether it's supporting local or international ministries, especially in this time of need, whether it's keeping Ben and Zach gainfully employed with good insurance. Um, it runs the gambit. We have teachers that volunteer out there that we're able to have the lights on and the heat on in the room so that the kids can learn about Christ at a young age. So thank you for your faithful giving. We look forward to a great 2024. There will be more in December when the budget's brought before the congregation for a vote. With that being said, would you pray with me, please? Father God, it is truly a privilege to be in your church on this day with other believers and other people that want to know you. Lord, as we celebrate communion, not as a checkbox, not as a magic pathway that's going to get us to you, but as Paul says, as we celebrate remembering the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, that reconciles us, that brings us together, that settles that difference that we have. God, thank you for that as we celebrate that. And thank you for the faithful giving over the years, year after year, that has enabled us to continue this ministry here at 141st and Allisonville. And Lord, we look forward to see what you're going to do in 2024. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all you provide for us. It's your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us here today. And with so many people in our church sick, we've heard so many stories this morning of people being home with various illnesses. This is a good opportunity for us to do something we don't often do, which is acknowledge the people who are live streaming. We've been doing that for several years now. We don't always give them a whole lot of attention, but if you are watching online because you're at home sick or because you're traveling or for any other reason, thanks for joining us as well. Imagine for a moment that you're sitting at home enjoying a quiet morning to yourself when suddenly your doorbell rings and it's a fellow believer who you know quite well. So you politely invite them inside, you make a pot of coffee, you exchange some pleasantries, but eventually do have to ask, so what brings you in? Your brother or sister in Christ appears to get nervous. They fidget with their fingers, they stumble over their words, but they eventually work up the courage to say, well... In light of some recent events I've been through, I'm struggling with my faith and considering abandoning it entirely. And I just needed someone to talk to. What do you say in that moment? Well, at first, you might not say anything. Instead, you listen patiently, you express empathy, and if it gets that far, you put an arm around them and weep with them. But at some point, you will have to say something. And if you believe that Jesus is God's son, and that faith in him is the only way to peace with God, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life, then you can't help but try to persuade them to reconsider. But how do you do that? How might you motivate this tired, discouraged, and uncertain believer to keep the faith when they're tempted to throw in the towel? The author of Hebrews may have been asking himself that same question throughout the course of writing this letter. Many of the Christians hearing his sermon are exhausted, beleaguered, and wavering in their faith to the point of thinking about abandoning it completely. So in our passage this morning, the author shows us four different ways of motivating those believers to keep the faith. And we should hold on to these truths if we hope to motivate others to keep the faith, or for those times when we need motivation ourselves. So open up to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Feel free to use one of our Bibles if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't have one. But before we read, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your church. Lord, I pray for our church this morning. I ask that you watch over those people gathered here in this room to worship you. I pray that our worship would be honoring to you, beneficial for us, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in this Sunday morning. I pray that you would comfort us, encourage us, challenge us, convict us. You know what we need better than we do. And so I pray that you would provide for our needs through your word, through your spirit this morning. I pray for those who are not here. As we mentioned, we have a number of people who are sick. We pray for those dealing with acute illnesses who normally would be here. We pray for those with chronic illnesses who can rarely, if ever, be here. I ask that you watch over those people dealing with sickness this morning and any other morning. I also pray that you would be with those in our church who are grieving, those in our church who are celebrating, those in our church who are traveling, uh, whatever they might find themselves in. I pray for the people of this church, that you would unify us, that you would sanctify us, that you would provide for us and help us be the church and the people you call us to be, not just for this hour and 15 minutes today, but throughout the week and throughout the months and throughout the years. And Lord, again, thank you for the book of Hebrews. 
thank you for the comfort, the encouragement that it provides us, but also the challenges. I pray that you would be with us as we read from your word this morning. Give us open hearts, open ears, open minds to what you have to say from your word today. We love you. We worship you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the first way we might motivate someone to keep the faith is by recasting how they got to the point of abandoning it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. The author says there, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? This is a quote from Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Suffering is a common entry point to doubt and discouragement. Someone loses a job, goes through a divorce, mourns the death of a loved one, or receives a shocking health diagnosis. Any form of suffering can make a person wonder whether God is real, or even worse, if he cares. But in these verses, the author of Hebrews recasts our suffering in the light of Jesus. First, in verse 3, he reminds us that Christ suffered too. Now, how is thinking deeply about Christ's suffering on the cross helpful in the midst of our suffering? Well, it tells us that we're not the first. We're not the only people who have ever suffered. And in a strange way, that reminds us that we are not alone. Jesus suffered too, and God still cared for him. So God just might still care for you in the midst of your suffering as well. But second, he also tells us that our suffering could be worse. In verse 4, Now trust me, I know how cruel that can sound. We never want to quickly, flippantly, or glibly pull that card. And if we do, we can come across as cold, distant, and dismissive of someone else's pain. We have to acknowledge all of that. But we also can't avoid the mild rebuke that is verse 4. And this rebuke exists because if we're honest about it, we do have a way of drowning ourselves in self-pity when things go wrong for us. Sometimes we need to recognize our tendency to cry, woe is me. And while our suffering really may be great, we can also acknowledge that none of us will ever suffer as much as Jesus did. So we view our suffering differently in the light of Christ. And third, in verse 5, our suffering could be a form of God's loving discipline. That word discipline has some negative baggage associated with it. But the kind of discipline we're talking about in Hebrews 12 is not punitive. It's not a punishment. 
This discipline is formative. It isn't vindictive, ill-timed, or ineffective, the way discipline can often be from our earthly parents. Rather, it's given for our good, at the right time, in the appropriate measure. Our suffering, if we understand it as God's loving discipline, doesn't prove that God doesn't care about us. It proves the opposite. It proves that we are his children. At times, God may allow us to suffer for the sake of training us, shaping us, and forming us the way a loving parent does for their child or a competent coach does for an athlete under their leadership. Now, sure, that discipline might not be pleasant. The author says so in verse 11, but it can grow us in holiness. It might not be as senseless as we think it is. So one way to motivate a doubting or discouraged believer to keep the faith is to recast their experience. Help them see or understand their hardship in a different light, in the light of Christ. But let's say you try that with your friend over coffee. And though you did and said everything right, With all the gentleness, all the care, all the nuance that these kinds of words require, they're still not convinced. What do you say then? Well, thankfully, the author has more tools in his belt. A second way to motivate that Christian to keep the faith is to give clear instruction. Let's pick up in verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So after issuing the commands of verses 12 through 14, which we'll come back to in a moment, The author reminds these believers of the story of Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 25, the selfish and conniving Jacob seizes the opportunity to buy his twin brother Esau's family blessing, which belonged to him because he was the older of the two. Esau was starving. His hands were drooping. His knees were weak after a long day out hunting. But Jacob only agreed to share his food if Esau gave him his birthright. That birthright was the last of Esau's concern at the moment, since he was starving. So he agrees to sell it on Jacob's terms and allows himself to get fleeced. Things get really messy in chapter 27 when Esau's eggs finally come home to roost. Now we might ask, what was Esau's core blunder? What was his most basic sin? What lesson are we supposed to learn from that example? Well, we might say that Esau's blunder was short-sightedness short-sightedness. He exchanged long-term blessing in the future for temporary relief in the present. Keeping our faith in a world filled with suffering, opposition, and questions is hard. It can leave us feeling weary, like Esau. And in the face of all this, we may convince ourselves that our life would be easier if we just stopped following 
Jesus. On top of that, the commands in this passage, striving for peace with others, pursuing holiness, resisting sin, those commands are not for the faint of heart. The promised blessing for a life lived in obedience to Christ often seems far off and useless when we think of the sacrifices that we must make now. But the author reminds us not to be short-sighted. Learn the lesson of Esau. Namely, that the future blessing of keeping the faith drastically outweighs the temptation of temporary relief. So by now, maybe you feel like you're getting somewhere with your struggling friend. They're thinking about their suffering in a different way. They're also considering whether immediate relief from their current predicament is good enough reason to trade their birthright as God's children by faith in Jesus Christ. That's real progress. If nothing else, by God's grace, you've persuaded them to at least slow down before they make any big decisions. But you still get the sense that there's more work to be done. So you try another approach. A third way to motivate your struggling sibling in Christ to keep the faith is to remind them of what they'll be missing if they give up now. Verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the Hebrews beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. One commentator calls these verses the rhetorical climax of the entire book of Hebrews. And that's saying a lot, because there's a lot there. I don't think you can blame them. This truly is a majestic passage. What the Old Testament Israelites saw at Mount Sinai after God led them out of Egypt was magnificent. In fact, it was terrifying. But what Christians get to experience is even more amazing. It's not something you shy away from. It's something you cling to. You have come to God's holy presence. You get to see God's kingdom. Here the angels celebrate. The saints are raised. The image of God within us is restored to its rightful glory. And best of all, Jesus crucified, resurrected, and ascended. He's there. Do you really want to miss out on that? Is our current suffering so bad that we would forfeit a reward like that? Is temporary relief really so great that you would trade these kinds of privileges for it? Have you taken for granted the amazing gifts that God has already given you now and will one day give you down the road? Have you forgotten the blood that Jesus shed for you? The blood that justified you? Don't give up now. Press on in faith, even when it's hard, knowing the glory that lies ahead of you. So now you really feel like you're getting somewhere. Your friend is rethinking their suffering. They're considering Esau's error. 
and they're remembering that reward which lies ahead. You can already see their eyes brightening, their back getting a little straighter, and their knees getting a bit stronger. But then just for good measure, you do throw in one more approach. And surprise, it's an approach we've already seen multiple times throughout the book of Hebrews. That fourth and final way to motivate this believer to keep the faith is to give them an honest warning. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Someday soon, on the day of judgment, God is going to shake everything up. And when he does, the stuff that doesn't last will fall away. Only what's worth keeping will remain. Like a child looking for stones in a riverbed, a sifting will take place. The same way that water, sand, and tiny minerals will float away. Only what's precious in God's sight, his kingdom, his people, will survive that shakeup. These verses are one of the many clear warnings in the book of Hebrews. And this warning concerns God's very real future judgment. In the end, there is only one kingdom that's worth keeping. Only God's kingdom will stand the test of eternity. Likewise, only those who have received that kingdom, only those who have believed in and followed Jesus by the power of the Spirit, will remain. So press on. Keep the faith. Take your place in that eternal kingdom that will not be shaken, that is not going anywhere, secured for you by Jesus himself, rather than being consumed. You know, different people are motivated in different ways. Some people respond well to positive reinforcement, while others are more driven by negative reinforcement. Some people are motivated by measurable progress, others by public affirmation, others by a sense of personal accomplishment, others by grades, others by competition, others by a quiet voice, and others by a fierce yell. And as we press on in our faith, we may need different forms of motivation at different times. Sometimes we need to recast our suffering in the light of Christ's suffering. At other times, we need simple instruction to avoid short-sightedness. Still other times, we need to be reminded of just how great our eternal reward really is. And yet other times, we need an honest warning about the reality of God's judgment. So wherever you are right now, and whatever you need to be inspired to press on in faithfulness to Christ, whether you're trying to motivate another believer to persevere, or you need motivation yourself, perhaps the words of Hebrews 12 can give you some helpful resources. Of course, you will need to use them with some discernment. 
A seminary professor recently told me that half of pastoral ministry is determining whether a fellow believer needs a hug or a kick. And as you can imagine, that requires wisdom. Likewise, we need wisdom when applying these words to others or to ourselves. Verses 3 through 11 and 25 through 29 may fall more into the kick category. Meanwhile, verses 12 through 17 and 18 through 24 fall more into the hug category. Depending on who you're talking to and when you're talking to them, some may be more effective than others. But these words are all here for a reason. The kicks and the hugs all have a place. And they can all motivate us or the believer who knocked on your door to keep our faith to the end. But whichever approach might work best for you in your present circumstances, I'd also point you to the same passage we closed with last week. It's chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Commentators debate whether those two verses conclude chapter 11 or introduce chapter 12. And I think they do both. Because whether it's the words of Hebrews 12 or the stories of Hebrews 11 that best motivate you to keep the faith, the verses right in between, verses 1 and 2, are always fitting. Keep running your race with Jesus as your foundation, your strength, and your endurance. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Lord, thank you that in a world that is so often shaken, we look forward to a kingdom that will not be shaken. Even right now, we're already part of a kingdom that will not, cannot be shaken. Thank you for that assurance Thank you for that promise. Thank you for that hope. But Lord, we also acknowledge that keeping the faith in a fallen world is not for the faint of heart. We can't do it on our own. We need your spirit within us to help us and preserve us. We also need our siblings in Christ to encourage us and motivate us. And we need passages like Hebrews 12 to challenge us, whether it's recasting our suffering whether it's being reminded of our future reward, whether it's being warned about judgment, or whether it's simply getting simple instruction. I pray that you would use Hebrews 12, that you would equip the believers around us, that you would equip us as well to motivate your children, to receive our reward, to secure our inheritance that is guaranteed for us by faith in Christ. Help us press on, Lord, when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we're frustrated, when we're discouraged. Help us keep the faith for your glory. We love you. We worship you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, 
the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. concludes our service this morning. Again, thanks for joining us, whether you've been around for a long time or whether you're new. We're glad that you were here. If you have any questions about who we are or what we do, what we teach, what we believe, what we practice, uh, we'd be happy to have those conversations with you. You can find someone with a name tag, in which case they're probably an elder or a pastor. If a person doesn't have a name tag, they could very well answer your questions as well. So feel free to talk to the people you see around you. And if you're in a situation where you're that person knocking on the door and you're struggling with your faith and you're discouraged and frustrated and considering giving up, uh, by all means, talk to us. We would love to do our best to encourage you, to 
serve you, to pray with you, to even motivate you, if we can, to press on in faith, including those times when it's hard. So if you have questions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, or if you just need help following Jesus, uh, by all means, please talk to someone here. But with that, I'll close our service in prayer. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that this service, whether it's the songs or the prayers or communion or the sermon, I pray that this service would be one small part of strengthening our weak knees and lifting up our drooping hands because following you can be hard. So Lord, I pray that you would give us strength, give us endurance, give us perseverance to go out another week and follow you to represent you well to the world around us at school, at home, at church, in our neighborhoods, in our families, wherever it is that we might go. Uh, Lord, help us persevere, represent you well, and press on in the faith. Again, we thank you for this time we've had together. We thank you for your son, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Lord, I pray that we would move ahead knowing that you are at the foundation and that your kingdom will not be shaken. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Praise God from whom.